Um, so the next is Janae Price. I guess you are. Um, I don't know that I'll need it. <laughs> I don't. Probably not. Um, so good afternoon. My name is Janae Bryce, and it is my pleasure to be called Alayla's first poet laureate. <laughs> Former teacher over here. <laughs> um, it is a singular honor um, to pay tribute to Ernest. J. Gaines today. Um, not only to the man, to his outstanding contribution to literature, legacy, and life. So for me, um, preparation for this occasion has been um, threefold, really. Surprising, exciting, and um, exacting. Surprising because um, matriculating through the Valencia Unified School District, Ernest J. Gaines' novels were not required reading. Even upon graduation and going to college and even afterwards, graduate school, not required reading. And to me, they should have been. It's been an exciting time of preparation because I've been forward to this time since I was invited. So thank you, Kay. But it's also been exacting because studying the works of Ernest J. Gaines, reading his novels, and watching the movies again brought up a lot of emotions that have to be reckoned with. So surprising, exciting, exacting, all necessary for this time right now. A Lesson Before Dying takes place in Louisiana during the 1940s. Louisiana, a southern state with all that that means. Practicing the abominable practice of American slavery down through the Civil War, Reconstruction, hateful Jim Crow laws, everything that that means. A lesson before dying took place during the 1940s. And learning a bit of my family history, my father and his family were from Louisiana. He grew up in the 1940s. Thus, I give you emeritus. To me, the trees in New Orleans look like ladies with tattered sleeves on ancient dresses, flowing like lingerie. Their hymns and slips skirt the waters of old Pontchartrain. train. Long, coarse hair on tall, proud heads tightly quaffed yesterday. Simple strands now swing and sway to the sounds of Zydeco, waiting for callers who never come. Yet they stand, still offering shade and a hiding place. was simply about the trees in New Orleans. Times that I remember visiting family members down there, and also when we dropped our daughter off at uh, Xavier University. Um, so it brought back lots and lots of memories. But often those same trees held some strange fruit. Fruit that was not planted there, but fruit that was hung there. Our fathers. Our grandfathers, our uncles, our sons. But not everything about the South is negative, of course. Some of the people I love the most are there now. In fact, my mother's people are from Georgia, cities like Griffin, Decatur, and Macon. I even spent my first year in college at Morris Brown College in Atlanta, Georgia. The, yeah. <laughs> Thus, I give you Decatur. That certain something is that southern something. That slow, low, drawn out drawl that slips from their lips and comes to a crawl. Covering consonants and vowels and sounds like black strap molasses on a stack of Johnny cakes. That certain something 
is that southern something like grammatical gravy on a plate of show enough. <laughs> that certain something is that southern something that points to slower days and points out slower ways. Salmon croquettes and powdered sugar beignets. It sounds like singing, a cappella that is. There's something to that southern sound that calls me home and wraps me round, that thick vernacular, that jargon, that jive, like new nectar from an ancient high. That certain something is that southern something. It is that gentility, that homegrown smile and hospitality. Sitting on Cousin Edna's porch, sipping sweet tea, sipping sweet tea. Oh, yeah. <laughs> My mother's people from Georgia, drawn here by the promise of employment on the great Bear Island Naval Ship. The Mitchell brothers came, their sisters in tow, one of which was Doris Viola, my grandmother. So she and Grandpa settled in on Magazine Street. And in honor of my grandmother, I give you retrospect. Though wisteria dripped like lavender locks on the head of a beautiful woman, bees were busied and dizzied and frenzied by her rare perfume. The bushes were obedient soldiers with regulation haircuts. And then there were the birch trees, clumped together in groups of threes, like bananas. This was my grandmother's yard. We are here now in California. My brothers, my sisters, my cousin. Buzz is back here videoing. He knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> California, named after a native black woman, Queen Califia. Some things, of course, have changed. Absolutely, they have. Some progress has been made, to be sure. But make no mistake, bigotry still abounds. Racism still resides. Disparity still despairs. And still, some believe that black is wrong and white is right. Even today, despite our every effort to teach equality. But there is one thing that struck me in the novel, A Lesson Before Dying. Because, let's face it, some of our young people have never read it. They are not familiar with Ernest J. Gaines. And part of the challenge of a teacher is to make history relevant. But one of the threads running through that novel that made such an impact on me is when Tom Newton, the sassy black woman played by Cicely Tyson in the movie, and Miss Emma, who was Jefferson's grandmother, one of the things I believe they were trying to say when they commissioned, <laughs> not so gingerly, Grant Wiggins, who was the college-educated professor, Tom Lou and Miss Emma said, Grant, I want you to teach Jefferson to die like a man. Well, as you can imagine, Grant stepped back from that challenge saying, how can I do it? Because I'm not sure how to do it myself. But after you have been beaten down by a system that does not care, by an educational system that pushes you to the side, I believe it was Tom Lou, Miss Emma, and Grant Wiggins' challenge to get Jefferson, the doomed young man, to see that he was just as good. Just as good as anyone else in his little Louisiana town, just as good as anyone else as he sat there in that jail cell awaiting execution, it was Grant Wiggins' challenge to teach him that no matter how hard, how harsh, how sad, how miserable, how wrong your circumstances, you must remember that you are just as good. I give you just as good. A little girl asked her mother, Mother, I wonder why. Why my teacher 
stranger never calls on me, though I raise my hand really high. Her mother looked her in the eye, as to be clearly understood. Your teacher may not consider you to be just as good. To her, you may simply be taking up space, an empty head atop just another black face. But I want you to know this because I know you should. Child of mine, you are most assuredly just as good. Because for every Marilyn Monroe, remember Josephine Baker. For every Maria Montessori, remember Mary McLeod Bethune. For every Christopher Columbus, there is a Hannibal. For every Sir Francis Drake, there is a Matthew Henson. For every Billy Graham, there is a T.D. Jakes. For every Babe Ruth, there is a Jackie Robinson. For every Thomas Edison, there is an Eli Whitney. For every Louis Pasteur, there is a George Washington Carver. For every Fred Astaire, there is a Sammy Davis Jr. For every Tommy Dorsey, there is a Duke Ellington. For every Mozart, there is a Quincy Jones. And for every George Washington, there is a Barack Obama. Whether you like it or not, you are just as good. I hope you take this as our lesson before dying. You are, we are, just as good. Yes.